Hey, Anchor West. Man, it's my joy to be with you this morning, worshiping live online. I tell you what, we are so excited for what God's doing with Anchor West. This week, you guys are meeting online, and you'll continue to have that option for those who are worried about COVID issues, or maybe out of town, or even sick that day. But if you have a chance to, we want to invite you in the future. From this point on, for the foreseeable future, we will be meeting at Elevate Trampoline Park. How fun is that going to be? It'll be a great time to worship the Lord together. And we encourage you to invite your friends. I mean, how neat and different is it to say, yeah, my church meets at a trampoline park. It's an easy invite. We're praying for you each and every week, and we hope that today's message, our worship, and our teaching will provide an opportunity for you to connect with God. Hey, send us a message. Get on the website. Go to anchorchurch.com backslash west. If you click down at the bottom, contact us. There's a great opportunity for you to send us a message, a note of encouragement, or maybe even a prayer request. We want you to know we are praying for you, and we're grateful that you're a part of this ministry. Do me a favor right now. Hit the button share on your Facebook page directly to your page so that you and your friends can hear about Anchor West. Let's get ready to worship God this morning.
Word Church, we're so glad that you're here to worship with us. You know, there's so many ways that we worship as we gather together on a Sunday morning. We listen to God's Word. We're transformed by it. We apply it to our lives. We give as a response to God giving His Son to us. And then we sing. So why don't you prepare your hearts to worship God in singing now? Anchor Church. We're so glad you're here with us today. Today we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit and how unfortunately Christians can stifle the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so go ahead and get ready as we watch. We're getting ready to watch a video about the Holy Spirit and his different names and attributes.
Me? Hey, good morning, church. So glad to be here this morning. I'm glad to have technical difficulties right at the beginning of a web service, but that's okay because I know you're still tracking with me and we're here excited to spend time in God's word this morning. I'm so excited that you've chosen this morning to spend some time with us going through God's word. And today, as we finish up 1 Thessalonians, uh, looking at just some great, wonderful scriptures to empower us, to inspire us, to walk with the Holy Spirit, to have him move in our lives. And I know that's what you guys are looking forward to, too. Uh, you know, some of the mission of Anchor Church is to go out into the world and to transform people's lives through the work of Christ in us. And we know that we're able to do that because the Holy Spirit empowers us to do that. So this week we're looking again, First, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to look at verses um, uh, 19 through 20, we're going to go through the whole end of the book today, uh, we're going to spend our time looking at just a few specific verses. Uh, maybe if you remember last week we went through looking at, there was actually three do's that Paul gave us. He told us we should be joyful, we should be prayerful, we should be thankful. If we're going to be full of anything, you know, if someone's going to say you're full of it, let's be full of thankfulness, of joyfulness and prayerfulness, let's be full of those things. This week, we're going to look at uh, Paul giving us some instructions on things we should not do. And if you'll turn with your, me in, uh, in your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses uh, starting again in verse 19. We're going to read just the first couple verses of that through verse 22. Verse 19 says this, Do not quench the Spirit. Verse 20, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So you see he gives us four don'ts in this passage here. He tells us we should not stifle God's working, we should ignore God's word, we should not accept false teachings, and we shouldn't practice the things of the world. He tells us we shouldn't quench the spirit, don't despise prophecy, test teachings, hold to the right ones, and abstain from every form of evil. These are some deep, great, insightful things that I think we as the church don't explore enough, and I'm so glad we get to talk about it today. As we, start, we jump in, just starting in verse 19, he says these just simple words, don't quench the Spirit. I mean, if you, you think uh, right off the bat, you might think, man, I don't want my spirit quenched. I don't want to have myself be overtaken by that. I don't want to have my fire put out. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the spirit of a person being uh, discontent or something like that. He's specifically talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You know, uh, my family and I, we like to have campfires in the backyard. We love to roast marshmallows, go out there. We have s'mores. It's often my little boys ask every single night. If it's windy, they want to go. If it's a nice day, they want to go. They always want to go to the backyard and have campfires. Uh, one of the things they like to do, of course, roast marshmallows. Another one is actually to put out the fire. Uh, if you've never done this in a while, it's, it's, it's a big event, especially to a young kid. You know, we've got this, this big fire going, and we're going to spray it. We're going to have this, this huge thing that was hundreds or thousands of degrees are going to pour this cold water on, and there's this, this bubbling, there's this percolation, there's all the steam. It's all this noise. It's this huge reaction that happens when you extinguish this fire, when you put it out, when you stifle it, when you stop it, when you starve it. It's this big, huge thing that happens. And I hope you can see already probably where I'm tracking with this is, you know, the Bible talks about God being a consuming fire. God working in our lives. God doing some amazing things. And Paul tells us, don't quench that. Don't put it out like it was a fire. If the Lord is a consuming fire, don't try to extinguish that work in his life, in your life. That's exactly what his point is here. It's not talking about your spirit. It's talking about not stopping the work of God in your life. This is an amazing thing, you know. This is an amazing thing to think about because we know what we know about the Holy Spirit. And I think if we're going to get the clarity that we need on this, we've got to do a little bit of backtrack, maybe some, some basic theology kind of understanding things so we understand what the Holy Spirit does, who he is to us, and how he works in our life. So just a quick recap, a little bit of theological knowledge for you here. Feel free to write these things down. If you didn't already know, what a great reminder to you to, uh, for the first time that I could just share this with you. Uh, the Trinity, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity. That's what we, we know about God from the Scriptures. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All three are co-equal. All three are completely and fully. God, but still independent personalities within the Holy uh, within the Trinity. Uh, he is all power. He is equal with God and Jesus and the Father in every single way, with power, with authority, with dominion. He works in that. Uh, Romans 8.26 tells us the Holy Spirit prays for us. I hope you take encouragement from that today, knowing that you don't walk alone when you pray. The Holy Spirit walks with you to pray. Romans 8.27 says he searches our hearts. He knows the mind of our spirit. So he's our accountability partner. He checks in on us. Galatians 4, 6 tells us that there is intimacy with him. Do you know there's intimacy with God? He's not far off. He's, he's near. He's close to his people. Galatians 4, 6 says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Of course, we would say, Lord, God Almighty, but we also get to call him Father. Intimate, close fellowship with the Father. The Holy Spirit gives us understanding. He enlightens us to understand the things of God. 
John 16, 13 says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He won't speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand the things of God better. He also empowers us for service. Acts 1.8, when Jesus is telling this great word to his disciples that we know, uh, you'll be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to go and tell the whole world about who Christ is and what he's done. He convicts, he guides, he teaches, he brings scriptures to memory and so many other things. He does all of this in us, through us, and for us. And if he does those things, though, why would we ever try to stop his working? I mean, why would Paul take the time in this letter where he's been expanding on all these different things for the people? Why would he say, make sure you let God work? I mean, is that something that even man can even do to stop God's working? I, to me, that seems like trying to make a cork big enough to fit a volcano. You're not going to stop that power behind it. So how? how? How would we quench God's work? How would we quench the Spirit? How could a person stop God from working? What, what's the fire extinguisher for that? The simple answer is sin. The simple answer is sin. The sin might look a lot of different ways. It might be a laziness, you know, in ignoring God's call in your life to go and serve somewhere. Uh, maybe it's through a lack of prayer. Maybe it's disobedience. But whatever it is, whatever's happening in your life, the primary extinguisher of God's work in your life is sin. It's allowing the things of the world to overrule the things of God. It's your selfishness walking in there, that old flesh, that old nature that we've walked away from trying to come back in there and take over things. You know, sin in the life of the believer chokes out the work of God. It starves it. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. We, we ask sometimes, Lord, are you listening? The Lord is listening, but there is a prayer that he does not listen to. It's from those who love iniquity, those who practice sin, who don't let the Holy Spirit continue to work in them that way. It is our sin that will stifle the work of God. It will stifle the fire of God inside of you. And that's why you can see why Paul was putting so much emphasis at the beginning of this book and in so many of his other letters about the importance of holiness in the life of a believer. Because if we're going to stop the work of God, if we're going to see things grow the way we want them to go. If we want to see Anchor Church grow the way we want in the communities around us and impacting the lost of Albuquerque, we cannot have sin in our lives because it stifles the work of the Holy Spirit. And most of us know that uh, one of the great descriptors from the scriptures uh, about Jesus is that he's the light of the world. You know, we have the light of life inside of us because of what Jesus has done for us. We're told we're supposed to let our light so shine before men that people would see God working in us and then give him glory for that. He says you don't put a, a candle under a bowl after you light it. You, you give it out so that the whole room can see that. The charge is that we would not stop God's work. We would not extinguish. We wouldn't stifle. We would not inhibit. We would not hold back the work of God. We would intentionally, willfully, joyously shine the light of God through our holy living. Jesus is the light of life, John 8, 12 tells us. Do not, let me, let me just say it as clear as I can, do not stifle the work of the Holy Spirit. Do not extinguish the work of the Holy Spirit by allowing sin into your life. Maybe that's you right now. Maybe, I don't know who's going. I don't know if you're watching this 20 years from now. I don't know if you're watching this live as we've just launched it on Facebook. But I know these words ring true for some. Because I know still, I've been a pastor for years. I've been a Christian for years. I still struggle with this stuff, church. I still struggle all the time. I'm so thankful for the grace and mercy that Jesus has shown me in this. But let me give you that encouragement today. I promise you there is nothing in this world that tastes sweeter than the work of Christ in your life. There is no thing that ought to grab your eye better than the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. The call in our life is not just to be Christians on Sunday mornings, but to give all of it to Christ, to live in such a way that people would see those works like I just mentioned, but would not stifle that work of the Holy Spirit. Because look what happens. I was saved because of the work of the Holy Spirit. You have been saved because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Ministry happens in our communities and in our churches because of the work of the Holy Spirit in you as his people. There's a reason we're called the body of Christ. It's headed by Jesus. He's the head of that body, but the Holy Spirit is the power and the emphasis behind it. Don't stifle that work, church. Don't inhibit. Don't do any of that. Your life, not just your Sunday morning, must be his. Your life, not just your Sunday morning, must be his. So let him teach. Let him, let him guide. Let him direct. Let him correct. Let him encourage. Let him challenge. Let him exhort. 
let the Holy Spirit do the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Let him bless you. Let him grow you. Do not do the things that would stifle the work of God in your life. He doesn't stop there, though. Paul wants to make sure this church is built up in every way. So he says, of course, don't stop the work of the Spirit. Don't stop him at all. He also says in verses 20 and 21, don't despise prophecies. Test everything. Hold on to what is right. You know, there are countless churches, denominations, sects, cults, all different kinds of churches out there claiming that they have the truth. You know, churches disagree, though, on spiritual gifts. They disagree about the rapture. They disagree about the validity of certain texts in the Bible. There's all kinds of different arguments we can have. That Can I just tell you as a side note, that's not doing the church any good. We've got to have right theology, but we cannot do that at the expense of the gospel, letting other people see Christians in fight. We've got to be all about the gospel of Christ and bringing people in there, not infighting among things that matter but that don't matter. Don't despise prophecies. When someone has a word, we, we take this in. That's what he's talking about here. Uh, so many churches claim to have truth, but we know that this, this is the ultimate source of truth, where we, we delineate everything, we base everything off of this. Thessalonica, the small church that Paul was writing to, was no different. There was different ideas running around the church. They didn't even have the whole canon of Scripture then to even weigh these things against. So what was happening is people that were excited, just like today, excited about the things of God, but maybe not necessarily informed enough, started teaching things, started saying things. Some had dreams and they said, this must be from God because it just felt so real. Or I think I heard this while I was out doing my quiet time, walking around and praying. I thought I heard this. And so people started getting these ideas about all these different things that were going on. There's causing theological controversies, causing disorder and disunity in the church. And so Paul talks about these things uh, to address it because the people were having a kind of an opposite idea of it. Instead of taking all these things and formulating into their theology, they thought, we don't know what's true. We don't know how to delineate what's right, what's wrong, so let's just not listen to it at all. If it's not from Paul, we're not going to listen to it anymore. We're not going to take those things. They're not going to weigh them. The response of some was to say, we're not going to listen to anything anyone says because it might be false. Imagine if we did that with the news. If you did that with your, your Twitter feed, you're like, oh man, that thing on Twitter wasn't right, so I'm probably not going to listen to anything ever again. What if we, a warning label or something told us the wrong thing one time, would we say, we're not going to do that? Of course not. Just like we wouldn't stop eating if we had a bad meal, we would not stop listening to the things of God. What his point is here is that we should not despise when people think things about the Lord or share things with us, but we've got to weigh them. We've got to make sure that they line up against the scriptures and they are perfectly accurate in every way. Paul challenges them to do this, not to despise when people brought things in there. Don't get mad when someone brings something into the church. By God's grace, maybe it is a word from the Lord that they've got something. Of course, we've got the canon of Scripture now. I can't emphasize this enough, church. This is where we delineate. This is what we listen to. If someone says, I got a word from the Lord for you today, they probably don't. We take it from the Scriptures. But during this time, someone would come and say, I've got an idea. They didn't have a way to do it. So some people would say, I don't want to walk into error. What a great, great thing to do. But we cannot do it at the expense of not reading other things, not welcoming in the word of God from other people who might bring this, as long as we're lining it up. You know, if you read through the church history, things like that, Paul's journeys, uh, where he planted churches, uh, you'd know that in uh, Acts chapter 17, immediately after Paul goes to Thessalonica on his travels, he goes to the, town, uh, to the area of Berea. And we know the Bereans as the people who searched those scriptures. Acts 17.11 says the Berean Jews were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. He's not burning Thessalonica, by the way. He's just saying, here's a good trait in Berea. Uh, For they received the message with great eagerness. They were excited to hear what Paul had to say. And they examined the scriptures day to day to see what Paul said was true. They wanted to check and make sure that what they heard was true. They did not want to wander into error, into false doctrine. And church, I hope that's your heart. Because I tell you, there's so many things out there today that are warring for your attention and churches out there that think because they've got a funny pastor or because they've got this great worship team, because they've got some kind of great ministry, because they have a multi-million dollar budget, they can do all these things. Hey, praise God for people like that who are truly serving the kingdom of God. But so many of them at that level start to miss the important points of pouring in the scriptures to people and reminding them that it's all about the word of God, it's about living for God, not living for an organization, but truly living for Christ to examine that, to, to not wander into error. We want the truth. We don't want the idea of church. We don't want the idea of Christianity. We want the truth of Christianity. I hope you're saying amen with me on that. We want the truth of God's word to come through us. 
You know that that's a, a, a principle that the Bible lifts up very, very heavily? Accuracy in theology. Some people I've heard, I don't want to talk about theology. It causes division. Of course it causes division. It divides truth from error. People need to see what is true and what is right and what is pure and weigh that against the worldliness that we hear out there so many times. Uh, it's held up as a virtue. Uh, Luke's commending those uh, who were diligently searched the scriptures here. Uh, John 1, 4, 1 says, test spirits. Jeremiah says, uh, God's telling people, don't trust all these prophets. Some of them are just looking for themselves. Second Timothy tells pastors, you ought to rightly divide the word of truth because truth matters, church. Truth matters. We want absolute truth and clarity in this. They didn't have all the scriptures. They had the Old Testament. But what they did is they went and they sought out those answers. They wanted to find those things. And I hope that's your heart too. Do you know that Anchor Church offers a lot of different ministries in that way? From our small groups to small uh, outside uh, teaching classes we do. We're actually starting at the West Campus in about three weeks. We're going to start uh, kind of a Bible basics class, new to the faith kind of class, where we walk you through what we believe about God, what you can, how to pray, all kinds of different practical applications. And everyone's welcome you know, to come and join that. Just let us know. But we want to do that to make sure that the church, that all of everyone around us is equipped to know the truth of the word of God. That you might hear someone say something someday and say, I know that that's false because I've got the scriptures to clarify that for me because the spirit of God has enlightened me to the truth of the word of God that something someone taught me might have been false. This is an essential principle for us to follow. And let me offer that as a charge to you, Anchor. Be people who know the scriptures. Be people who know and love the Word of God, who love the truth of God, who love the purity of the Word of God. You want to know those things so we know the Scriptures, so we know what we believe, we know why we believe, we can stand up to uh, any attacks that might come against us, but also, you know, just to, to test what's true. We want to obey what God's Word says, and we want to test what is true in this. We want to know what we believe, why we believe it. We want to defend our faith because there's a lot of loud voices out there in the world that will make a lot of pithy arguments that do not stand up under scrutiny but might make you feel intimidated if you don't know the Word of God. So let me encourage you with that. Dig in to the Word of God. Do you need a degree to do that? Do you need seminary training to do that? Absolutely not. Do you need to know what you believe and why you believe it in order to understand and follow it and obey it? Absolutely. 100%. Every single person needs to do this. You know, the Bible is actually written at approximately a fourth grade reading level. There are certainly some deeper truths in there, but the, the translation, the presentation of, are something that's simple truths that if you are, if you're literate, you can, you can get those principles, you can understand it. Of course, there's, there's deep, deep truths you can dig in. You can spend hours, years <laughs> digging through things like that. But at the base, you can understand it because it's written in such a way that anyone can understand it. God's word is not meant to be hidden from people or to say that you have to have a, a PhD in something. It's meant to be written to the, low, the, to the lowest, not in stature, but just the, the least of these. That anyone might understand the word of God. Anyone and everyone might be able to come to faith through the work of God. As you read through this, let me just give you encouragements. Don't discount the work of the Holy Spirit who teaches you all things. That's what John 14, 26 says. You might read the scripture and say, I don't understand all this. Hey, pray, ask about that. Talk to one of your anchor pastors. Talk to your small group leader, and they'll pour into you in that. It was written so that anyone could understand. It was written so that the man or woman of God would be perfect, not lacking anything. 2 Timothy 3 says, Now that we have the full word of God, we can walk fully assured that it is accurate. It's up to us to know. It's up to us to understand. It's up to us to put it into practice. Weigh what you hear against the scriptures. Don't, don't take in everything that's there, but don't despise teachings. When someone comes and says, hey, I, I, uh, I want to talk to you about the scriptures, talk to them about the scriptures. Walk through those things, but be the person who knows them well enough to divide that truth from that error. This is Paul's talking about. We've got to be able to divide truth from error. Know what's true. He tells us, don't despise those things of God here. Verse 20, do not despise prophecies. Do not despise. He's not talking about, uh, just so you know, prophecy is not always speaking uh, of telling of future events. Truly, in the truest sense of the word, prophecy is just speaking forth truth. Literally, as I read the scriptures right now, I'm technically prophesying. I'm speaking forth truth. Don't despise those things. What he's talking about here, though, is not maybe our necessarily our, our standard idea of despise. You know, we might turn that to hate, what he means here is it doesn't give respect. Don't give honor to it. Don't give attention to it. 
at the heart of this matter, we're not talking about ignoring teaching so much as we are charged to give the right respect, honor, and authority to God's word and to proper teaching. We ignore the bad stuff. We dive in full force for the truth of the word of God. When we know the pastors of Anchor Church are up here exposing the word of God, certainly weigh what they say against the scriptures. Make sure they're doing that. But you can trust that these men have prayerfully gone through the word of God, seeking to find that truth that we might deliver it to you as the congregation that might, you might be built up. We want to teach you those things. We want to give it the right respect, the authority, the word of God, and proper teaching. I used to think of an example I would share with my kids. You know, if I was to leave a note on the refrigerator that says, hey, I want you to, to take out the, the garbage and do the dishes when you get home. Uh, and they came and said, well, Dad didn't tell me that. Some note told me that. There's the same authority in that word as it is for me because of who it's from, right? It's the same thing as with the word of God. These are literally the words of God written through men to the ears and the hearts of his people. And we might know we should divide these things. And because it is from the word of God, directly from the lips of God, we ought to show it the right respect, the right honor, the right authority. Church, there's got to be a reverence. We've got to have a high view of scripture because this is where truth is. This is where truth is. I love how Paul is summarizing this whole message. He's talked about practical application, and here he wants to make sure that we know what we believe, why we believe it, and we are clear. Let God work in us and through us. Maybe some clarity on this we'll, we'll, we'll bring in here. Uh, the Greek word is the word ex nehu theo. I'm probably not saying that right. I don't speak English very well, let alone Greek. But either way, the, the, the Bible says in the ESV, don't despise. It implies a dismissive disdain, as in just saying, you should take God's word seriously. If we want to break it down, we should take God's word seriously. I wonder if we even just took a moment right now. Do you take God's word seriously? I don't mean, do you, do you not believe it? I don't mean, uh, do you not trust it? What I mean is, do we take it seriously as though it is the word of God written to us? I've heard people say, you know, that the Bible is an outdated book. This book is, is timely. It is timeless. It is always relevant. It's not something we used to use. This is what we use. This is the source of truth. But I wonder, do we take this and just say, all right, well, I'm a Christian, so I think that way. Do you really believe that when God says we're going to be witnesses to all the world, that you're supposed to be one of them? Do you believe that when it condemns certain activities that you say, you don't try to justify, oh, well, that's okay because God understands? Do we take it seriously? Do we, do we base your marriage on this? Do you base how you interact with people on it? Do you trust that God's got things well under control in the midst of a, a world system that seems to be falling apart because of COVID and racial and social unrest? Not a, not a basic, just kind of generic, uh, I, I have a faith, but a true faith that looks to the Lord for everything, trusts in his word for everything. The word here means we should take God's word seriously. If you've ever had a maybe a coworker or a classmate or even a child in your house sometime, uh, you know that you might get along fine with them, but there's times where you know they start to rub you the wrong way. And so maybe someone will send you an email at work and you, you don't like that person because they bug you, so you just ignore that email. You say, I'm not even gonna listen to them anymore. Uh, that's the wrong answer to go that way. We certainly should not do those things with God's word. We do not treat God's word with any contempt or say, oh, I'm not interested in that right now. Maybe this might not be the right time to go through it, but we never put disdain or contempt to the word of God. It sounds weird to even say that out loud. But I've met Christians like that, who I believe are saved, but people who are totally walking the other way uh, in how they're doing that. I can see they've got this faith, but they're constantly going back and forth on this side, uh, back and forth between trying to walk that faith. Church, there's no walking on the fence. You're either with Christ or you're not. Can I encourage you to dig in to take that truth, to take God's word for what it is, and let that be the authority, the direction for your higher life. There is power inside of the believer through the work of the Holy Spirit for those who walk in these things. Take every word as written to yourself, Spurgeon tells us. When it thunders against sin, that must mean God means my sin. When it tells us a certain activity, that means God wants my activity. Take every word as written to yourself, he says. Don't be lethargic. Don't be apathetic. Don't be disinterested in the Bible. And if you're faithful to read it, be faithful to follow the commands as well. You know, Jesus said in a lot of different ways. One time he said, I think it's Luke chapter 6, he says, now that you've heard this, go and do likewise. That's the charge. 
Go and do likewise. We ought to follow these things. And God's word gives us these directions. We should not despise God's word when it's spoken. We should not despise God's word when it's read. Again, not hating it, not treating it with the authority, the respect, and the power that it has. Treating it with a reverence, understanding these, this is truly, this is the word of life. These are the words of the eternal God to a finite people who need to know him. Hopefully, you know, no one in the church despises God's word. However, I, I know some that have become numb to it. I know some that have become light listeners, some that are willingly dismissive because it brings too much accountability. Folks, if, if that's you, can I just say plainly, as, as your friend, as your pastor, with love, care, but with just a, a charge, you need to check your heart and your relationship with God if that's how you're walking right now. You need to check yourself in that. In the world we live in, Folks, there are so many things that are warring for your affections. You've got outside influences. You've got lusts and passions still inside of you. That I'm praying that God is working on all of us to change us to be the people he wants us to be. We cannot be an apathetic church. We cannot take God's word as though it's just something we just read on the side of the road, any random other article. These are the words of life, church. These are the words of life. So you need to check yourself in that if that's where you're walking. There ought to be no louder voice in your ear. There ought to be no louder thought in your mind than that of the things of God. News, social media, your own ideas about stuff should never take the lead in things. It should always be the word of Christ. Whether you read it or whether you hear it through sermons, whether a verse comes to mind through a certain situation, whatever it is, when you interact with the word of God, give it reverence. If Jesus was to say, hey, let your light shine before men so that people would see God's work in you and give him glory, and we're like, yeah, that's pretty cool, Jesus, and we just walked off, none of us would do that. We would not show a reverence to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, nor should we show that irreverence to his word. We must have a high view of Scripture. It brought everything into existence. It teaches, it corrects, it rebukes, it makes people perfect, it nourishes, it lights our way, it helps keep our way pure. Psalm 119 tells us all about that. And on and on, the blessings of God's word and his spirit in our life go through the scriptures. We love the Lord. We praise him for salvation. And we also revere, we honor, we bless, and we joyfully take in those words that he spoke to us through his word. We do not dis ignore or despise God's word. We invite and we delight in God's word. We do not ignore or despise God's word. We invite and we delight in God's word. I hope you do that. You know, can I suggest that maybe this is another way that the Spirit is quenched? By reading God's Word, but not listening to God's Word? Maybe not responding to the Word? Maybe not speaking or sharing the Gospel? Maybe not serving in a way that you feel God telling you to because you know you read it in His Word? Last thing as we wrap up here, verse 22. He says, abstain from every form of evil. Which essentially, just don't look like the world. Don't look like the world. Don't do the things that the world, people in the world do. You know, some of this, I think, can be understood by the principle or the practice of loyalty. Uh, Denver fans, let me just ask you, Denver Broncos fans, would you wear a Dallas Cowboys jersey? I can hear you yelling at your screen right now. Of course you wouldn't do that. And vice versa, right? You'd fight people to the death, or I love my Christian brother, but don't you wear that orange and blue jersey in here. People will fight like that, and it's ridiculous. Do you, have a, do you go to certain restaurants because they serve Coke instead of Pepsi? They come and ask you, is Pepsi okay? No, it's not okay. Do you have certain allegiance to certain things? Those are, those are weak examples. But you know, real fans would never give in to the opposing team, nor should the Christian ever look like the world. People ask me before, like, why, why did God give certain commands in the Old Testament? Why should we not eat shellfish? Why should we uh, only eat these kind of animals, certain, practice certain things? The simple reason is God designed it that way, but also to delineate them against the people of the land. To say, my people look like and do this. My people live this way. My people serve this way. My people worship this way. That's a similar point here, that we should not look like the world. Our allegiance is to Christ. We shouldn't be looking and mirroring and mimicking and acting like the world, but acting, living, and following the example set by Christ as we see in his word. It's almost kind of like a, a summation here from Paul. He says, I, I talked to you earlier in the book about how to live. Now I'm talking about don't stop God's work in your life. Don't look like the world here. He's basically saying, if I didn't already cover it, just in case, for those of you who might say, well, what about this or what about that? He's saying, don't even look like you're causing problems. Don't ever, ever let it appear that you are living in a wicked way. 
Don't live a wicked way. Also, don't ever let it look like you are living in such a way. Don't go places. Don't do things that make it look like you're not one of God's kids. Earlier in the book here, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, he says here, not in passion, don't live in the passion of the lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. He says the people that live like the world live like they don't know God. And when we practice those things, you look like you don't know God. I don't know about you, that's a conviction to me. I tell you what, church, that, that hits me. That hits home. Not because that's the way I live constantly, but just a reminder of I should never look as anything other than one of God's kids. Not perfect, mind you, because I'm far from that. We ought to never do anything that makes us look like we're not God's kids. If we are the Lord's children, we don't wear the other team's colors. Simple as that. What a final challenge from Paul. Allegiance to Christ before all else. Allegiance to Christ before all else. As he closes out the book, he says, you know, through verses 23 and 28, he, he offers benedictions, he offers a blessing, he calls for prayer in verse 25. Uh, he tells to greet each other with a holy kiss. That's on the cheek. Uh, we don't do that now because of COVID and because of culture. Uh, telling them to pursue, you know, connection, peace, love, and the fellowship. And verse 27 was another convicting one I want to kind of wrap up with here. He says, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. You better share what you know. Church, we've got some great truths. I hope you would share this video on Facebook. I hope if you're part of the North Campus and you're checking this out, you would share all the videos across all the campuses. that you would do your best to invite people. We've got some great new invite cards to bring people in to try to invite them to do that. No matter what it is, we look for ways and we intentionally share what we know. These truths are, by God's grace, are blessing you and helping you grow. Wouldn't it be great if you could do the same thing for others? That you could share that kind of blessing with them. God showed me this in his word today and it transformed how I think about this. The Holy Spirit of God is alive and active because I'm changing. If I did not have him in me, I would not be living this way. I would be living the old way. But he has changed me. The truth of God exposes all things so it should not be hidden. You know, one of the things we've learned across these past couple months as we've walked through this book are things that should be hidden. All should be believed. All should be believed. All should be obeyed. All should be promoted to other believers as the standards for life. For the standards for life. So maybe even as we end today, as we end this and kind of move into the next part, because next week we're going to jump into 2 Thessalonians and look at Paul's second letter to this great church. I want to just ask a couple questions to you, church. What, what's your biggest takeaway from this? Is Do you see a call to holiness? Do you see a call to a specific change in, in life and the way you've been living? Is there maybe a, a call for you to, to go deeper into serving the church because there are so many opportunities to serve? We've got three campuses, too, that are launching out brand new that need your help and your service and your spiritual gifts. Do you feel a call to evangelism? Do you feel a call that now you've learned more about Christ through this book of Thessalonians and say, I can't keep this to myself anymore? Do you, do you feel the call to set the example for others? Do you feel the call to, to finally read all the way through God's word? And to pick it apart, to go with a commentary and say, I want to know everything I can because I want to know my Father that I might serve my Father. I don't know what the conviction is because I'm not the Holy Spirit. But I know that Isaiah tells us when God is speaking that when his word goes out, it does not return void. It goes out and accomplishes what he wants it to accomplish. So I'm, I'm asking you, church, if, if God is trying to accomplish something, don't quench that spirit. Don't despise prophecies when people bring a word from God for you as long as it's scripturally based and not some pithy idea. Share those truths, walk in those truths, obey those truths. Church, if we want to be blessed people, we've got to follow that easiest, easiest saying command, not the easiest to follow, but the easiest command. Die to yourself. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the same is true for all of his kids. Please, church, don't let this today be just another sermon that you watched. Let this be the word of God speaking through his word, speaking through this message to you today to call you to action on these things. We ought never be complacent in the church. We ought always to let the Holy Spirit move through us. Church, I tell you, if we, if we will do these things, we'll practice, we are going to see results. We're going to see transformation. We're going to see marriages restored. We're going to see addictions broken. We're going to see relationships fixed. We're going to see people growing in faith. We're going to see the church growing stronger and stronger in number and work and ministry through the power of that Holy Spirit working in us. Let me encourage you with that today, and let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning to have your word in front of us. We are so thankful, Holy Spirit, that you live and move in us and you empower us and you fill us and you indwell us and you give us the ability to understand God's word and you give us the charge and the power to go out and to, to do the works of God. Father, I pray we'd be faithful in those things. Lord, I pray for all of our fellowships, north, south, west, and online, all our different campuses, Lord, that we would see this word. We would know your Holy Spirit is in us and that, Father, we would do our best to walk in your ways. That your Holy Spirit would never be quenched, but that if, if we can do anything in it, Lord, that we would help you to work in that. That, Lord, we would enable you to work in our lives and whatever truth that holds in there. That, God, you would work in us and through us and that you would do so for your glory. Lord, I pray for our church. I pray for conversations that we'll have this week. Lord, I pray for your word to impact us and to challenge and encourage us from the message today that we might make the changes that you call us to make. Lord, we want to be faithful in everything. We are so thankful to Jesus for the cross and for the life that we have in you. We're so thankful that we know that by believing in you, by receiving you, Jesus, by confessing our sins and asking to be saved, that you will bring us into your family and you will forgive us of all of that. I pray we would be the church that you have called us to be, Jesus. And may it all work for your glory. We ask humbly in Jesus' name. Thanks so much for being with us today, Anchor Church. We're so glad that you're a part of this. Please don't forget to, you know, to share this online. You guys can actually set up watch parties. You can invite other people to come back and watch this with you later. Uh, you can check this one out. Check out the South Campus. Check out the North Campus. I tell you, we have a plethora of information and wisdom for you, church, that we would love to share with you. So I invite you to do that. And maybe just a, as a simple practice for you, maybe a simple step for you this week is just to share that video, to take that step of faith to say, hey, this blessed me. Maybe I can try to bless others. Whatever we do, let's do it to the glory of God. You guys have a good week. We'll see you next week.